Epcot is finally out of her hot mess era and ready to take on a shiny new era of fresh experiences, new festival offerings, and returning favorites. So join us as we explore all the exciting enhancements inside Epcot's scene to make sure you're set and ready to take on all these new and classic attractions yourself during your upcoming 2024 Disney World visit. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Blog, and today is a very big day, and that's because we're going to be traveling to 11 different countries, numerous immersive glowing gardens, outer space, and even time traveling back into the past, all before you're done with this video. Epcot is the park that's experienced the most drastic changes in the Disney World bubble as of late, so we're going to tell you how to conquer this park during the new year, now that all those construction walls are finally coming down. Since we're gonna be covering a lot of new information today, make sure to scan that QR code you see on the screen now or head to disneyfoodblog.com slash Epcot to pick up our free quick guide for taking on this park in 2024, complete with full color pictures, ride wait time guides, sample itineraries, and a lot more. Ready to dig into what's new in Epcot? Here we go. So even the different areas of Epcot have taken on new identities during the park's major transformation. So let's take a quick virtual walk through each area, just to introduce or reintroduce you to what you're gonna find here. Epcot is composed of four distinct neighborhoods. Ready? I know, it's impossible to remember these. The first is World Celebration, home of the park's icon, Spaceship Earth. And don't forget about that giant golf ball-like sphere. It's gonna be important throughout the rest of this video. To the right of World Celebration is World Nature, which is home to several Epcot attractions, including the popular Soarin' Around the World flight simulator and brand new Journey of Water inspired by Moana walkthrough attraction. To the left of World Celebration is World Discovery, which transports you to the final frontier, space. This neighborhood is home to not only test track and mission space, but it also features the very first intergalactic world pavilion called the Wonders of Xandar, which houses Epcot's first roller coaster and Disney World's first Marvel attraction, Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind. Currently, Cosmic Rewind still has a virtual queue system that you can enter into at 7 a.m. or 1 p.m. the day of your visit via the My Disney Experience app, meaning you can't just waltz right up to the ride and get in a standby line. So make sure to set those alarms and grab your spot in the queue before it's all booked up. Or skip the virtual queue hassle entirely and purchase an individual lightning lane for around $14 or $17 per person per ride. And finally, around the entire backside of the park, you'll find the classic World Showcase, where you'll be able to take in the culture and cuisine at 11 unique country pavilions surrounding World Showcase Lagoon. Alrighty, I've told you Epcot's been up to a lot of stuff lately, so let me just fill you in on what this park's given us in 2023. First of all, After Hours events graced the Epcot scene starting on June 1st. After Hours are separately ticketed events that allow you to hang around the park three hours after it officially closes for everyone else, giving those party ticket holders the chance to experience lots of the park's most popular rides with way shorter wait times, while also grabbing some photos with Disney characters and enjoying complimentary ice cream novelties and popcorn and select beverages. That means all the Mickey bars you can eat and lots of soda pop too. Epcot's After Hours will start back up again this year on select dates starting February 2nd and running until April 4th, and they are super worth it in my humble opinion. All right, Shiki Sai Sushi Izakaya opened in Epcot's Japan Pavilion this past August. This is a table service restaurant with a menu that features Japanese delights, such as sushi and teppan items, plus an open sushi bar and grill. This replaced Tokyo Dining. It's not your typical sushi restaurant though. This one changes with the season, bringing a brand new celebration of food and culture with each month. It's also got these super cool digital windows for select tables that give you a virtual look across a Japanese scene. Plus, there's fireworks. Back in September, Figment's meet and greet started up at the Imagination Pavilion, aka the same pavilion where you can jump aboard his dark ride inside the World Celebration area. Journey of Water, inspired by Moana, opened on October 16th in the World Nature area to provide guests with an immersive walkthrough experience where you can play with magical living water. Side note, visit this one during the day and at night because once the sun goes down, it takes on a whole different glowing vibe that I think I might actually prefer. Moana herself also started meeting and greeting with guests around the same time near her journey of water experience. 
and Asha from Disney's newest animated film, Wish, also started hanging out with guests starting in November over at the World Showcase Friendship Ambassador Gazebo, WSFAG, toward the front of the World Showcase Pavilion. On September 5th, 2023, Walt Disney's birthday, Epcot opened Dreamers Point, which features a new statue of Walt Disney as well as a new World Celebration Gardens area created to evolve with the seasons, provide lots of extra seating for much needed breaks throughout the day, and also several different charging ports just in case you need to juice up your phone while you're taking one of those much needed breaks. But my favorite part about this new area is how it's brought back those retro Epcot vibes so many of us, myself included, have been aching to see again. Because once the sun goes down, the pathways around this World Celebration Gardens area illuminate with new lighting fixtures. These are reminiscent of those sparkling pathways we used to have in the former Future World, now World Discovery area. These new lights incorporate updated technology and controllability to deliver some fun new lighting capabilities. They even sync with Spaceship Earth light shows that happen throughout the evening. It's beautiful. Is it the same as the sparkling pathways? No but it is still beautiful. And finally, Epcot's newest fireworks show, Luminous, the Symphony of Us, also started up on December 5th. The absolute best part about this show is the composition, which has been carefully crafted to create a storyline of the human journey, following people as they're born, grow, fall in love, and experience loss, all while showcasing the beautiful harmony of what can be achieved when people come together. And maybe that's the absolute best part for you, but my favorite part of this is the fireworks. They have brought back a lot of fireworks for this particular show, and they are dazzling. But there has been some criticism about this show in regards to its lack of projections like Harmonious used to have. Ironically enough, I guess some folks actually do like the taco barges. But overall, Luminous is a show you're going to want to see at least once during your next visit, so you can form your own opinion about it. Overall, the DFP team thought it exceeded expectations, but we are excited to hear what you think about it too. Now let's talk about what isn't finished yet. So technically, Epcot's not quite done with all their updates and new stuff. While Disney originally expected to have Communicore Hall and Communicore Plaza, aka the new home base for Epcot seasonal festivals, open by the end of 2023, they ended up having to push back this release date to 2024. Still, we expect to see this area open up for guests relatively soon, especially since Festival of the Arts is only a couple of weeks away. And when the area does open, expect both the plaza and the hall to host a wide variety of experiences with food and art and live music and meet and greets and kitchen demonstrations and more. But wait, we're not done yet. Neither is Epcot. During Destination D23, which took place this past September, we learned that Test Track would be receiving a major remodel in the future. This retheme is going to reach back into history for inspiration from the original World of Motion attraction, which I love. You guys know that's one of my favorites. And it'll bring, quote, that spirit of optimism to the next iteration of Test Track. As it is today, Test Track focuses heavily on current technology with a nod to future possibilities. While we don't know the details about how Disney plans on taking inspiration from history, it does sound like that might be incorporating more of a full timeline of the evolution of transportation instead of just giving riders a glimpse into the creative future. We don't have any official date for when this transformation is going to start taking place. So right now, you can still ride the current iteration of Test Track in all its Tron-like glory. However, we'll be sure to keep you updated just in case this ride closes later on to start up the reimagining process. It's not just Epcot that's getting ready to take on major changes during 2024, though. It's Disney World as a whole. Three huge changes are coming to Disney World on January 9th that are going to affect your time in Epcot. The Disney Dining Plan, which allows you to prepay for your meals before your trip, is returning. Two plan options will be available for you to choose from, the standard or the quick service plan. But whichever one you decide on, if you decide you want the DDP at all, We'll guarantee one thing for certain, you're gonna get a ton of food. Both dining plan options will come with one snack credit per day, which you can actually use on several items featured at the Epcot festivals. And here's the real good news about that, you don't have to use the allotted snack credits on specific days. You can stack up your snack credits and use them all in one day on your Epcot day, if you want to. They just need to be used within your trip dates or else you lose them. So instead of just using one snack credit to get one festival item, sample three to six instead, depending on how many days you're in Disney World. Also, Park Pass reservations are no longer going to be required for date-based tickets, meaning you can choose to visit Epcot or any of the parks on whatever day you want. So you could even wake up in the morning and see what the weather's like. Plan accordingly. Where do you feel like going today? And park hopping is returning to normal, so no more waiting until 2 p.m. to finally start jumping between parks. 
Before the limit of 2 p.m. was put on park hopping, it used to be a challenge to visit all four parks in one day. Now we can conquer every park once more. I don't necessarily recommend that strategy if this is going to be your first visit and you really want to see each park to its fullest, but if you're looking for a way to shake up your next visit as a returning guest, you may want to use Park Hopper to eat breakfast in one park, head over for a mid-morning snack in another, and still have time to do a ride at a different park all before 2 p.m. I've already briefly mentioned how the Epcot festivals are going to be reshaped this year thanks to Communicore Hall and Plaza. But let's dive a little deeper into what you can expect from each fest during 2024, because Epcot is the festival park, my friends. They always host four seasonal festivals. The first is Festival of the Arts, which we call Farts, which focuses on three artistic disciplines, visual, culinary, and performing arts. During this event, you're gonna spend time admiring artwork and indulging in dishes and drinks featured around the food studios. Those are the food booths and watching a Disney on Broadway concert which showcases talented artists straight from the Broadway stage. Festival of the Arts this year runs from January 12th to February 19th. Next up, we've got the Flower and Garden Festival, which starts on February 28th. This takes time to really celebrate the art of gardening through character topiaries, butterfly houses, and outdoor kitchens, again, food booths, that put an emphasis on fresh seasonal ingredients. Internationally known musicians and local bands also take the stage during this event during the Garden Rocks concert series. Typically, Flower and Garden is a pretty long festival, lasting from that end of February and up past the 4th of July. After Flower and Garden wraps up, we've got the Food and Wine Festival, featuring over 25 global marketplace food booths. Again, food booths, they call them all different things for every festival, but they're all just food booths, and they're literally the same food booths <laughs> with different menus. Anyway, Food and Wine also has the Eat to the Beat concert series and additional family-friendly activities and a lot more. Now, a big part of this festival before the 2020 closures had always been the wine and beverage seminars and culinary demonstrations, but they've been on hiatus for the past few years. However, since Communicore Hall is being built with the intention of hosting kitchen demonstrations in the future, we are hoping 2024 is finally going to be the year those food and wine demos make their miraculous return. Quick word of warning about this fest, food and wine has been doing this thing lately where they hold off on opening all the global marketplace food booths all at once. Instead, they open a good chunk of them on food and wine's opening day, and then another chunk of them later on in the festival when the crowds start to die down, potentially as a way to rekindle interest again. So if you want a better chance of having all the food and wine booths open during your next visit, it might be better to visit them toward the second half of the festival instead of the first half. Food and wine is another rather lengthy festival, typically running from July to mid-November. And finally, we end the year with Festival of the Holidays. This is a time when Epcot transforms into a wonderland of international celebration. Throughout World Showcase, you can listen to stories and watch performances that celebrate traditions from every culture during this important time of year, while also snacking your way around the holiday kitchen food booth. <laughs> But the centerpiece of Epcot's Festival of the Holidays is the Candlelight Processional, taking place most nights from late November through the end of December. This traditional retelling of the Christmas story features a celebrity narrator accompanied by a choir and orchestra. Out of all the concert series, the Candlelight Processional tends to be the most popular. And because these shows are all first come, first seated, they tend to pack out the theater way before the show actually starts. If you want a way to guarantee your seat during any of these shows, during any of these festivals, you can purchase dining packages. Here at Festival of Holidays, it'll be called a Candlelight Processional Dining Package, and you can get it on the Disney World website once they go live. And it provides you with a breakfast, lunch, or dinner meal at a participating Epcot restaurant, and then you get guaranteed seating for the popular event. For 2023, dining packages Package prices ranged between $55 and $104 per adult. Let's talk about Genie Plus next. Yay or nay? Well, Epcot's got a nice variety of rides throughout the park. Some are more thrilling, some are more family friendly, but generally speaking, you don't really have to have Genie Plus to experience these attractions, unless you're planning on visiting during a really high traffic time, like Thanksgiving week or around Christmas or New Year's, then yeah, having access to lightning lanes could come in handy. But Epcot just doesn't have as many rides as Hollywood Studios or Magic Kingdom do. Here's the thing too, Epcot is so much more than just its rides. 
Rides are a ton of fun and you need to check them out, but even if you didn't go on a single ride all day long, you could still fill your day exploring all the nooks and crannies around the world, showcase pavilions, or taking on those scavenger hunts, or enjoying unique cuisine and browsing the different cultural shops and just flat out filling your day with anything besides just standing in line after line after line. Not to mention many of the Epcot rides during the park's average to lower crowd level seasons are not too bad of a wait. Attractions like Living with the Land and Grand Fiesta Tour starring the Three Caballeros, Journey into Imagination with Figment, Spaceship Earth, The Seas with Nemo and Friends, and Mission Space usually have little to no projected waits throughout the day. So even if the other rides have longer queues by the afternoon, there are still lots of rides you can turn to instead to pass the time. Not to mention, these rides are really fun and Epcot classics. Living with the Land, Spaceship Earth, two of my favorite rides in all of Disney World, not just even Epcot, Disney World. If you do end up investing in Genie Plus, the best rides to book Lightning Lanes for first are going to be Frozen Ever After and or Remy's Ratatouille Adventure. Test Track and Soarin' come in at the third and fourth levels. Now, for those of you who are interested in adding Genie Plus to your 2024 trip, keep your ear to the ground because big changes are about to happen to this add-on service, at least potentially. Currently, you can only book Lightning Lanes on the day of your park visit, but Disney's working on a way to help guests book Lightning Lanes before their park visit. At least that's what they said. That way, you won't have to worry about all the extra planning during your trip. We don't have a lot of details other than they said they're working on it, except that we do know Disney wants to release this update sometime in 2024, and we'll make sure to let you know when they do. Say what you want about Epcot, but this park goes hard when it comes to food options. You've got adventurous, you've got safe and satisfying, you've got character dining, you've got fine dining, you've got desserts that'll cost you 25 bucks, and you've got desserts that'll cost you under five bucks. This place has it all. While we've got a lot of restaurants we love here, we're just gonna stick with a handful of recommendations for today's video for the sake of time. But you can learn about so many more great Epcot food, snack, and drink options with our DFB Guide to Walt Disney World Dining Everything Bundle. In this multi-part digital guide, we've got reviews and pictures and advice to go along with every Disney World restaurant and every Disney World snack and Epcot festivals. You can pick up your guidebook bundle over at dfbstore.com website. We got lots of different bundle options too. Make sure you type in the code YouTube before making that purchase for some extra savings. All right, let's get back to some of that Epcot food. For international cuisine, let's go to Rosen Crown first. The Rosen Crown Dining Room is a cozy pub that serves British classics like shepherd's pie and fish and chips. And don't forget to order an imperial pint from the pub while you're here. While the dining room does need an advanced dining reservation most of the time, you can belly up to the bar at the pub at any time for a quick drink before heading back to the World Showcase. Now, Via Napoli over in the Italy Pavilion has hands down the best pizza in Epcot. Although the pizzas at this table service can be pretty pricey, the larger sizes are definitely big enough to feed a whole group. I love the Quattro Formaggi, AKA the four cheese, as well as the more unique prosciutto e malone, and of course the pepperoni pizza can be beat. Spice Road Table over in the Morocco Pavilion has indoor and outdoor seating and a menu that features tapas style dishes, including hummus and imported olives, fried calamari and brie fondue, grilled kefta, and lots of other small plate eats. While these dishes are all really packed with flavor, they may be a little too adventurous for kiddos and picky eaters. However, we've typically enjoyed most of the things we've tried here, and that outdoor view next to the water is absolutely gorgeous. Both Rose and Crown and Spice Road Table also have fireworks dining packages that offer a meal alongside VIP seating to see the new Luminous show. Reservations for these dining packages can be made 60 days out, just like regular advanced dining reservations, and are available to book directly through the Disney World website. And of course, I'm gonna give one more shout out to Shiki Sai over in the Japan Pavilion, since it's brand new and mighty tasty. You can check out our full review of this Japan Pavilion restaurant on our channel after this. For immersive entertainment in Epcot, we're gonna start at Beer Garten. This is a German buffet that can be a real great option if you're planning on traveling with a large group. Not only does this restaurant offer lots of German favorites like bratwurst and schnitzel and noodle gratin, but it also has live polka performances that happen all throughout the day. Now, how about Space 220? This is one of Epcot's other new restaurants and it's located next to Mission Space. Space 220 is currently one of the hardest advanced dining reservations to grab in Disney World. And that's because this highly themed table service shoots guests up into space where they dine in the Centauri Space Station. I will warn you, the prefix menu here is pricey and the food quality doesn't always measure up to the cost. 
But if you make reservations for the Space 220 Lounge instead, you can order from an a la carte selection of appetizers, you can try one or two space themed cocktails, you can skip the prefix price and still experience those out of this world views. Space 220 Lounge reservations are also pretty difficult to make, so don't forget to try and book them just as soon as they go live for you, starting 60 days before your trip. You may also want to see if there's any walk-up availability for Space 220 bar seating on the day of your visit, though any guests under the age of 21 won't be allowed to sit here. Garden Grill, in my humble opinion, is one of the best table service restaurants for families. This character dining experience is located on the second floor of the Land Pavilion in Epcot's World Nature area, and it gives you the chance to say howdy to friends like Farmer Mickey, Chip and Dale, and our bestest pal, Pluto. While you dine on all you care to enjoy comfort food like salad and mashed potatoes and meats and berry shortcake, cake, the dining room slowly rotates to show off views of the Living with the Land boat ride happening directly below you. For last minute reservations in Epcot, a couple of places we recommend are Hacienda de San Angel. This specializes in fresh Mexican cuisine. It's over there in the Mexico Pavilion, and it's the one out by the water, not the one in the pyramid. Now, the menu includes stuff like skillets and tacos, fresh corn tortillas, and a variety of margaritas. Because this is a waterfront restaurant, you may be able to catch Luminous from the comfort of your table. That's the new fireworks show, by the way. And while not every table will have fireworks viewing, it never hurts to ask the host up front while you're checking in if there are any fireworks view seats available. While they won't always be able to accommodate that request, they will do their best to at least check and see if it's something that can be done. Also, Creperie de Paris. Now this opened back in 2021 right next to Remy's Ratatouille Adventure and offers a mixture of galettes and crepes for pretty decent price points. That being said, the theming inside doesn't really have much going for it, so if you'd rather have a crepe but skip the sit-down meal altogether, you may want to consider trying La Creperie's to-go window, which is right next door. This does have a much smaller selection to choose from, but at least you get to enjoy it while being out in the France Pavilion itself, which is definitely well-themed. And Nine Dragons in the China Pavilion has a beautiful exterior, great service, and a few solid options on its menu, like the salt and pepper shrimp with spinach noodles. That being said, this restaurant definitely isn't for everyone. You can usually always get a reservation here, which is why it's in this section of the video, but if you've got a really stellar Chinese restaurant back in your hometown, then this is probably not gonna live up. However, it's great for last minute reservations and anyone looking for actually legitimately spicy food, which can be hard to come by in any Disney scene. Now, if you are really fancy, this is the section for you. These are the restaurants that are gonna cost you a lot of money, but be really, really good. So Le Cellier Steakhouse is where we're gonna start here. If you're looking for a great cut of steak in Disney World, Le Cellier has that great cut of steak. During your time at Le Cellier, you're gonna dine in a classic Canadian wine cellar with wooden tables, stone walls, and candle sconces while chowing down on some really top-notch selections like the Canadian cheddar cheese soup, filet mignon, and the signature poutine. Just a couple of doors down in the France Pavilion, we've got Monsieur Paul. This is one of the most expensive restaurants in all of Disney World. It just reopened with a brand new menu and a much more swanky vibe. So this signature experience starts with a glass of champagne for all of age guests and then progresses through five courses of French favorites like the turbo filet, escargot, roasted duck, lobster thermidor, and la verine palm caramel. This meal will put you back $195 per person, so don't expect to scarf down your food and jump back into the park all quick like. This dining experience will take you an hour at minimum, so if you and your honey bunny want to splurge on it for a date night, consider booking reservations toward the end of the evening or plan out a chunk of your day dedicated to just this experience alone. Also, keep in mind that there is an age limit for Monsieur Paul, so any guests under the age of 10 will not be able to dine here. In the same vein as Monsieur Paul, Takumi Te over in the Japan Pavilion is also A, expensive, and B, lengthy. But we do prefer it over Monsieur Paul if given the choice. In fact, we'd consider it to be one of the best restaurants in all of Disney World, for sure. Takumi Te is a signature restaurant inspired by Japan's natural beauty and currently offers two different prefix menu options. The first is the Kiku Omakase multi-course meal option, which is an omnivorous meal for $250 per person that includes your choice of Japanese A5 Wagyu steak, roasted duck, or grilled Chilean sea bass, along with several other courses that include seasonal appetizers, sushi and sashimi, lobster tempura, green tea, and dessert. And the second option is the plant-based Hasu meal for $150 per person, featuring the chef's selection of seasonal appetizers and mushrooms, veggie-based sushi and nigiri, deep-fried tofu, 
yuba rolls, vegetable tempura, and green tea with plant-based desserts. Takumi Te just recently updated their age limit policy, so now guests under 8 years old will not be able to dine at this establishment. Though kids probably wouldn't want to dine here much anyways, since this dinner experience is quite the time suck out of your typical park evening. Now how about something more budget friendly? If you blew all your cash on Takumi Te, the next day it's time for something cheaper. We're going to send you to Regal Eagle Smokehouse, which frankly I would send you to no matter how much you wanted to spend because this food is really good. Regal Eagle serves American barbecue inspired by different regions of the country. Think Memphis dry rub pork ribs, a Texas beef brisket sandwich, and Kansas City half-smoked chicken. And don't forget to stop by the outdoor bar for some specialty drinks to enjoy alongside your meal as well. And Sunshine Seasons, if you're trying to find a restaurant with enough options to please a whole bunch of different palates, then Sunshine Seasons can help carry the burden. This food court style spot serves up options for picky eaters like pizza rolls and grilled chicken and adventurous eaters like an Asian vegetable noodle salad and Mongolian beef. There are even a few options here for plant-based eaters too, like the vegetable korma and a Mediterranean sandwich. And looky there, another fairly new restaurant has made it on our list. Connections Cafe and Eatery is yet again a solid option that can help you feed the whole family without breaking the bank, while also finding something that everyone's going to genuinely enjoy. When Connections Eatery first opened, it featured a few more interesting internationally inspired options, but lately the menu has kept things pretty simple, with items like burgers and chicken sandwiches, pizza and salads. Connections does have plenty of indoor seating, so finding a seat in the AC should be fairly easy to track down. Not to mention, this is also the place that sells Starbucks drinks right next door in Connections Cafe, so you can eat, relax, and get your coffee fix all in one spot. Now, what about epic snacks? Epcot has them. We're going to start in Caramel Kusha. You're going to smell Caramel Kusha before you come up to it in the Germany Pavilion. And if you're anything like me, that aroma alone will more than be enough to convince you to order some sugary and buttery and caramelly goodness on the inside. Some of our favorite snacks here are the caramel popcorn, caramel butter bars, and caramel cupcakes. See the theme? But keep in mind that there is no seating inside this cozy yet cramped little candy shop, so you'll need to take those treats on the go. If you're looking for a nice frozen treat as you make your way around the World Showcase, then stop by Kabuki Cafe right outside the Japan Pavilion for some kakigori. What on earth is kakigori, you might be asking? Well, <laughs> it's a refreshing shaved ice treat topped with fruit syrup and sweetened condensed milk if you want that. And this bite-sized menu also features snack-sized portions of sushi and ice-cold beverages, including the frozen Kirin beer and sake mist cocktail. Next, we're heading over to the France Pavilion to Les All Boulangerie Patisserie. This is a tucked away bakery. It's right at the very back of the France Pavilion, full of French-inspired eats, both savory and sweet. You can get sandwiches, soup, salad, pastries, macarons, you name it. We like to order a bunch of different things and share them among the team. Leal is also one of our favorite places to go for breakfast since it's open earlier than most World Showcase restaurants in the morning, and that means, yes, you can get a mimosa at 9 a.m. In case you can't tell, we really love the snacks over in the France Pavilion, so I can't talk about Leal without also mentioning Lardes and Deglas. This is a little sweet shop that features 16 different flavors of house-made ice cream and sorbet at all times. And for you adult folk out there, you can upgrade your ice cream experience to an ice cream martini, served with your choice of Grand Marnier, rum, or whipped cream vodka. And additional specialty items that are good for all ages include the macaron ice cream sandwiches in seasonal varieties, brioche ice cream sandwiches, aka the Krog Glass, which is basically the best version of hot and cold together, and cappuccino served with ice cream, cafe glass. There's so much to do in Epcot. We are done talking about food for now, but sometimes the fact that there's way too much to do in Epcot can be a curse rather than a blessing. So when you mix the intense heat and large crowds and foot cramps and never ending list of things to do before the park day ends, it can create a recipe of stress, which is the last thing you wanna get wrapped up in while you're on vacation. That's why when Epcot gets a little too much, we like to track down little hideaway spots where we can just hang out for a little bit and breathe and collect ourselves. Believe me, it makes a big difference to know where these spots are so you can just sort of decompress and chill for a second before you head back out there. So feel free to use any of our favorite hidey holes for your own sake and sanity. First up, the Bijutsu Khan Gallery. Many of the World Showcase pavilions feature exhibits that honor part of that country's culture. And in the Japan Pavilion, you'll find a kawaii exhibit located at the exit of the Mitsukoshi department store. This indoor air-conditioned display teaches guests all about kawaii, or Japan's cute culture. 
and how that ties to the rest of Japanese tradition. There's also a room dedicated to Tokyo Disneyland and Disney Sea, which I miss so much every single day, so that's a fun place to go. There's also a pretty neat Zen garden display right outside the exhibit, along with Japanese music playing low overhead. We typically don't find this area too busy, but even if there are guests inside, it's usually not very loud and rambunctious. Similarly to the Japan Pavilion, the China Pavilion also features an indoor air-conditioned exhibit, but this one is all about Shanghai Disneyland instead. You're going to find tons of props and displays and costumes here, but what you won't find are a lot of loud noises or guests. Located just steps away from Journey into Imagination with Figment is an air-conditioned theater called the Pixar Short Film Festival. During the show, you'll watch snippets of charming Pixar stories, which makes for a fun break for adults and kids alike. So Epcot sounds like a fun time, right? But how are you going to make it over there in the first place? you got a couple of different options, but each of your options will be determined by what resort you end up booking. For instance, if you're staying at Art of Animation or Pop Century or Riviera or Caribbean Beach, then you have access to the Skyliner. That'll take you right over to the park via Sky Gondola, making it both convenient and fun. If you're staying at Polynesian Village, Grand Floridian, or the Contemporary, you'll have access to the monorail. You will have to transfer over to the specific Epcot monorail once you arrive at the Transportation and Ticket Center, but once you make that transfer, you're on your way. If you're staying at the Boardwalk Inn, Yacht and Beach Club, or Swan and Dolphin, your hotel will literally be steps away from Epcot's International Gateway, the back entrance of the park. So you can just walk on over to Epcot whenever you want, with a valid park ticket in hand, of course. Some of the resort rooms, however, might still be a bit of a walk away from the International Gateway, so if you want to save your steps, you can always hitch a ride aboard one of the Friendship Boats instead. Friendship boats are available at all of those resorts, Yacht and Beach, Boardwalk, Swan and Dolphin. So you can grab that boat and head to both Epcot and Hollywood Studios. If you're staying at any of the other Disney World resorts that are not within walking distance to the park and do not have Skyliner or monorail access, then you can always take a complimentary Disney bus over to the park. Many good neighbor hotels, besides just the Swan and Dolphin, also offer bus transportation to the parks, but you'll want to read that fine print before relying on those shuttles, since they could have a really strict schedule or cost extra to use. You're always welcome to take a rideshare to the parks too, or drive yourself over, but if you're not staying at one of the Disney hotels, parking will cost you $30 each day. If you do decide to drive and you wind up having to park way out in the boonies, fear not, Epcot recently brought back its parking lot trams a few months back to help deliver guests to the front gates without forcing you to walk forever in a day just to reach them by foot. So I'm really excited with the direction Epcot's been moving lately, and I'm even more excited to see what else is in store for my favorite Disney World park. So keep checking back here with us as we continue to learn more about what's on the horizon. And don't forget to download our free Epcot quick guide over at DisneyFoodBlog.com slash Epcot. Thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks for watching. We've got ultimate guides to all the other parks for 2024 as well, so be sure to watch those. There should be a playlist for you so you can access them all super easily. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog, and we'll see you real soon.